I'd have never made a projectionist. That was part of a clip from the fourth protocol of a film I've just made for a company called Rank. I, uh, I used to work for Rank years ago. I was an office boy in their offices in South Street when I was 17. And I always remember that J. Arthur Rank, who uh, was the boss of the company, was very strict and there was no smoking. So one day, I nipped down to the toilet to have a smoke and it was in the next one. And I got fired. And uh, you can always tell a rank film by the, the logo. You know what I mean, the logo? It's um, like MGM, it's a roaring lion. Paramount, it's a mountain. Fox, the searchlights over the uh, skyscraper. Well, the rank logo is the big golden gong. In fact, there was nearly no gong at all. Fifty years ago, there was a, a company called General Film Distributors, and this was founded by a wolf, C.M. Wolf, in fact. And the story goes that they, they needed a logo, you know, like the uh, MGM lion. So they went out to London Zoo, and they filmed a wolf. Well, when they got the film back, the wolf looked so mangy, they decided to use something else. So some bright spark in the office uh, suggested someone banging a gong. The, uh, the man with the money behind the company knew very little about films. What he knew about was flour, the self-raising type. His name was J. Arthur Rank. He was a very religious man, a Methodist, and he used to make religious films. Well, one of them, for, for example, was called St. Francis of Assisi, with Donald Wolfett as St. Francis and a very young Greer Garson, then unknown. Ask yourself the question, who is my master? If you have not... This is the first film that Arthur Rank made, a 20-minute short called Mastership. When I was a boy, I used to go to a youth club in South London, run by a Methodist minister. And they used to show us films like these. You know, I don't know why it is, but since we've got home from that meeting, we seem to be better, happier, if you know what I mean. Oh, mind you, I'm not taking all that chap said for granted. Why not, Dad? What, for you? Yes, I do. I believe that if all the world believed in what that man said, there'd be no more unhappiness. Many years later, when I was in America, I heard a phrase which described it, watching one of those films. Uh, a man said to me, he was talking about something very boring, he said, it's like watching paint dry. Then he got involved with a film called The Turn of the Tide, quite a famous film in its way, um, uh, which, uh, w which he spent all his money on, to only to discover that he couldn't get a release. But nobody would show them. Um, the Gaumont British circuit turned their back, the Odeon circuit turned their back. So he bought this uh, distribution company, then he started to make real movies, so he needed a studio. So he built Pinewood Studios. Charles Boot heard that Rank was increasing his activities and said, why don't we build a really lovely studio? Something like they have in Hollywood. Uh, let's call it Pinewood. With the opening of the Pinewood Studios at Ivor Heath, Buckinghamshire, one of the finest and best equipped film studios in Europe is dedicated to British film production and the service of the screen. The sponsors claim that in layout and design, the new studios are comparable with Hollywood's best. And this is obviously appropriate in view of the place that British films have won in the world today. Pinewood was modelled on the Hollywood style with studio rules and discipline, and yet it was set in this fabulous landscape, Heatherden Hall in Buckinghamshire. The gardens at the back have been used in scores of films over the years. You've probably seen that bridge half a dozen times before, and with a little bit of smoke, you could turn that orchard into a scene from a horror film. And out on the back lot, there's a tank. You remember Sink the Bismarck? Well, that's where she sank. Pinewood was more of a movie studio in terms of uh, tradition and glamour than than any other studio that I've been to, much more so than Warner Brothers or Fox or Paramount. They had this marvelous, um, huge dining room, um, which was beautiful. It's like dining out a fabulous bar where you'd usually see Trevor Howard knocking back a few vodkas early in the morning. I associate it with Backlot in December. 
if I want to look on the downside. I think one of my dearest memories of Pinewood Studios are their bacon and mushroom sandwiches. What I always say is you... <clears throat> But back to the 30s and Pinewood's first big success, Pygmalion, which was edited, incidentally, by none other than David Lean. I used to live I, in the Pinewood Club. Uh, there was a swimming pool, there were very nice bedrooms, charming offices. Cut, the cutting rooms are still there, just as they were. And uh, Pygmalion was a great film to work on. You know, Wendy Hill, it was her first big part, very young. Leslie Howard, who I liked very much, and Anthony Asquith, known as Puffin. He was a hell of a good director. I must go now. Goodbye, Mrs. Higgins. Pygmalion was the first of three films from the works of George Bernard Shaw. A flamboyant producer called Gabriel Pascal had managed to persuade Shaw to give him the rights, and Pygmalion was a big box office success, helped by the one infamous Goodbye. line of dialogue. Excuse me, Miss Doolittle, but uh, would you be walking across the park? Because if so, I... Walk? Not bloody likely. I'm going in a taxi. In 1938, not bloody likely, was a scandal and people used to go to the cinema just to hear it being said oh it's no use i shall never be able to bring myself to use that word now he'd made all these real movies and he wanted somewhere to show them so he bought some cinemas several hundred cinemas as a matter of fact it's amazing what you can do with a bag of flour This cinema I'm sitting in is the Odeon Leicester Square, which is the flagship cinema of the rank circuit, the Odeons. He bought these in the, the 30s off a man called Oscar Deutsch, who built all these Odeons all over the place. And they said, they said, what does it mean? And he said, Oscar Deutsch entertains our nation. That's what Odeon means. My wife said to uh, save her a seat. As you see, I have done. Appalling, I'm afraid. They weren't the greatest thing in the world. The 30s, I don't think, the British film industry. I suppose there were some. Hitchcock made one great film. Now, there's only one thing left to do, you know. Search the train in disguise. As what? Well, uh, <clears throat> Old English gentleman. Let's see through you. I'm not sure I... Ah! <clears throat> Will Hay, for instance. Now... Boys, boys, uh, which of you have stolen Miss Froy? Hold up, hold up. Those glasses. What? Give them to me. Why? They're Miss Froy's. You sure? Yes, they're exactly the same. Gold ring. Where did you find them? Well, down here on the floor, the glasses broke. Well, probably in a struggle. Quick. I think they just pick up the glass. You realize that this is our first piece of really tangible proof? That's a lot. Will you please give me those spectacles? Pinewood became established by the time the war broke out. It had made uh, a dozen quite nice movies, quite good movies, by which time also, I may add, Rank had uh, added Denham Studios to his empire. And so the D and P Studios, as they were known, was an incredible organization. They had the two biggest studios in Europe, and they were making lots of pictures. They were not good films. I mean, in fact, they were fairly terrible films. I mean, Caravan and Madonna of the Seven Moons and love story and all that are dreadful, but they served their purpose because, don't forget, there was a war going on then, and we entertained. It was escapism. There was very little realism about them, but they were escapism, and they were romantic, and I looked gorgeous in all those funny costumes. Go to my carriage at the West Gate. Just one moment, Lord Rowan. That'll do, Rugby. I'll deal with you presently. May as well have the truth now. Your wife believes that I can make her happier than you've ever tried. I ask you to set her free. If you feel your honor demands satisfaction, I place myself at your disposal. I may be obliged to thrash you, Rugby, but we can hardly fight. And as for your freedom, Clarissa, coming from this adventurer, the suggestion's insolence. 
there were a lot of uh, films where uh, there, were, the, the, there was a composer who was given six months to live and played the Cornish Rhapsody and then Patricia Rock fell over the cliff and Margaret Lockwood got into bed with Stuart Granger and Gene Kent came in and caught them. There were a lot of those type of movies, but they all did well. Those romantic novelette type movies uh, you know, what, The Man in Grey, uh, which made a, f a star of James Mason and, uh, and uh, Margaret Lockwood, Wicked Lady. They all did well. They were, um, they were the Barbara Cartland type of movie, but they did well. Not so fast, Captain Jackson. I've not deceived my husband yet. Then it's time you began. The careless fool deserves all he gets. One moment. What of the jewels and the money? Keep them. I can be generous if you can. I'd like to drive a hard bargain. So do I. And I made a film called uh, Season Cleopatra, which took a year and bankrupted very nearly Arthur Rank. I want a boat at once. A Caesar boat. and Cleopatra was produced by Gabriel Pascal, and it cost one million two hundred and seventy-eight thousand pounds. I am Apollodorus, a Sicilian, your servant from the bazaar. I have no time for garbage today. Get me a boat. You cannot go on the water except in the royal barge. Royalty of Tatatita lies not in the barge, but in the queen. The touch of your majesty's foot on the meanest boat in the harbor will make it royal. Apollodorus, you are my perfect knight, and I will always buy my carpets through you. Can you row? My oar shall be your majesty's wings. Ho there, boatman! And I said to her, Pascal, we hear that the film is very good, of course, but we hear it's running over budget. What do you have to say to that? So he said, well, he said, what does it matter? Let Mr. Rank sell another few bags of flour. From his home above Hollywood, one man recollects the golden days of the British film industry. First a cameraman, then a producer, then a director. Ronnie Neem. Of course, it, it was during that same period in the history of British film that we had a few, actually had a few British film stars. Um, we don't seem to have quite the same uh, setup today. But I remember we had James Mason, of course. We had uh, Phyllis Calvert. Phyllis, I don't think she, she really liked me very much because um, she was the big star, you know, and, and I, I, I don't know, I made three, I'm a very good actor, you see, because I played all these love scenes with Phyllis Calvin. We didn't like each other very much. Harry, I, I can't let you go. I can't. He'll kill you. I saw it in his eyes. I oh, know he won't. He's probably just as rotten a shot as I am. Harry! My own darling. Anna Neagle, Patricia Rock, Margaret Lockwood. All of these people were there and became stars because they played in one picture after another. Um, I said Johnny Mills, didn't I? Well, Uncle Arthur appeared one day and he said, uh, I think it would be a good idea if you uh, signed a contract with us, you know, I think it would be rather nice. So I said, um, well, I, you know, I like working for you and uh, what have you got in mind? He said, well, um, I said, would you like to talk to my agent? He said, no, I wouldn't, wouldn't like to talk to your agent. He said, I'd like to talk to you. So. Um, I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, have you got a piece of paper and pencil? And I said, yes. He said, well, do you want to write your contract? And I said, you joking? No, he said, I'd like, we'd like to have you. He said, uh, you can have a directing pro a contract, producing contract, and that. He said, just write down how much you want. It was quite extraordinary. Hey. I remember making Man in Grey, and then I made Love Story and Waterloo Road back to back. One is very romantic, one was a spiff. Get it on, Tilly, and wait downstairs. I played a soldier on leave, and Jimmy Granger played the heavy. And we, we traveled along parallel lines, but never met. And there was this tremendous sort of thing about when we did meet, what was going to happen. And in the script it said, and, and uh, the soldier just hits him on the chin, knocks him down. And I said, well, that's not good enough. When we do meet, they're going to expect an enormous explosion. And so I persuaded Sidney to shoot a fight. Jimmy had done a lot of boxing, and so had I, and we really had a go. And everybody remembers that movie for the fight. The war saw the closing of Pinewood, apart from a few films for the RAF. It still made money, though, for part of it was used for the Royal Mint. But down the road at Denham, they were making a great film. 
in which we serve, starring John Mills, Bernard Miles, and Noel Coward, who was the co-director with the novice, David Lean. Come on, clear the way, more clear. Number two guns cleared away, more clear. Number three guns cleared away, more clear. All guns closed up and cleared away. Communications tested, sir. All quarters closed up to action stations up. Very good. Open fire. Noel Coward asked me to come and work with him on In Which We Serve. And uh, he said, my dear, I've never made a movie myself. And I want a good technician. And several people have recommended you. And that's how I got the job. <laughs> Someone will see you. Oh, God. <laughs> Hello, Blake. What are you doing here? I'm on my honeymoon, sir. Well, that's splendid. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is my wife, Mrs. Blake. How do you do? Well, pleased to meet you, I'm sure. It was a marvellous experience because it was a terrific team. I mean, Noah was wonderful. He directed the actors and the dialogue. And David, you know, put the camera in exactly the right place at exactly the right moment. And he shot it beautifully. I mean, it was a wonderful job of, uh, of direction. Noel, fortunately for me, got very bored with the long waits it took in those days, particularly to light the scenes. And so he used to first would disappear to his dressing room by, for, during the first three shots, three or four weeks of the shooting. And then in the end, he disappeared altogether and, unless he was acting in the scene. So I literally directed it, which was fun. He did some things in it which were very revolutionary. I mean, I don't think the ripple dissolve had been done before, in which we said, and, and David Lean did that, with the paper in the water, the ripple dissolving away. <laughs> see faces like Michael Wilding, James Donald. Oh, and Dickie Attenborough, of course. He was extraordinarily young. I remember uh, going on to that set and first meeting this uh, staggering man, uh, Noel Coward who was known as master, um, as everyone knows, I think, by everybody connected with the movie. I mean, whether it was Johnny Mills or Mike Wilding or Bernard Miles or Celia Johnson, or, he was master and he was to, to all of them. She's still afloat. Yes. The destroyer goes down in the Mediterranean, you know, and we had a tank built in the studio at Devon, which ostensibly was the Mediterranean. We all used to lower ourselves holding our nose into the water because the smell of the oil and the sawdust and so on was simply dreadful. And, uh, but never, never the master. Noel came up the steps, stood on the edge and dived into the four foot six tank, the most terrible belly flop. And on this particular occasion, he went in and he emerged from the water. He hadn't got very much hair, rather like mine. And he came out of the water with the oil and stuff pouring off his face. And he said, well, there's dysentery in every ripple. <laughs> 1944 brought Shakespeare to our screens and Laurence Olivier, star and director of Henry V. Now sits the wind fair. Uncle of Exeter, set free the man committed yesterday that railed against our person. We consider it was the heat of wine that set him on, and on his wiser thought we pardon him. That's mercy, but too much security. Let him be punished, Sovereign. This example breed by his sufferance more of such a kind. Oh, let us yet be merciful. We doubt not now, but every rub is smoothed on our way. Then forth, dear countrymen. <laughs> Let us deliver our puissance into the hand of God, putting it straight in expedition. Cheer it to see. <laughs> the signs of war advance. <laughs> no king of England, if not king of France. Rank liked films with a message, and Henry V's theme of heroism and patriotism were timed just right for the end of the war and victory in Europe. Arthur Rank was a very, very nice man. Uncle Arthur, you know, there's no accident he was called Uncle Arthur because he was a kind of uncle to the rest of us. Whatever anyone can say about um, Uncle Arthur, Arthur Rank, as a, a serious filmmaker, 
and there are people who said he didn't know anything about movies. He was at least responsible for, for the golden age of, of, of British movies. I mean, he was responsible for making it an industry. We were working and the studios were going full blast. People were under contract and uh, it was recognized as a going concern. That was uh, Arthur Rank and nobody else. He did it. J. Arthur Rank's great achievement was to, um, to give people the freedom to make their own films. I mean, companies were formed to make films under the Rank banner. We could literally do what we wanted. If we said we wanted to do this or that subject to Rank, he'd say good. Your no. David Lean is one of the absolute greatest directors of all time. First of all, he was an editor. I worked with uh, Lubitsch's cutter, who was called Merrill White, and he taught me everything I know about cutting. It was a jolly privilege to work with him. He knows exactly what is going to happen to that film when he gets it in the cutting room. I knew that if Alec Guinness said, I can do it, he can do it. And that's why we cast him as Fagan in Oliver Twist at the age of, I think he was 36 or 37. Sir, sir, my dear, I only tried to frighten you. I saw at the Rudolf Steiner Hall in London, I don't know if it's still going, uh, a production of Great Expectations on the stage, which Alec had actually written. It was damn good too. And he paid a pale young gentleman in it, Herbert Pocket. And of course, when we came to make the film, we asked him to do it. And he was absolutely marvelous. That was his first part. And the first day was uh, when he had to come to my chambers, Pip's chambers. And we had that marvelous scene at the table with eating, eating the food. And uh, Alec was very nervous. I mean, really, very, very nervous indeed. And. Uh, we got on very well, and he, we, we shot him, and he, he gave a wonderful performance. That, I think it was his first, first appearance. Herbert. Yes, my dear Pip. As I've been brought up a blacksmith, I take it as a great kindness if you'd give me a hint when I go wrong in my manners. With pleasure, though. I should guess you'd need very few hints. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, please tell me more of Miss Havisham. Ah, yes, Miss Havisham. But let me introduce the topic by pointing out that in London it's not the custom to put the knife in the mouth, for fear of accidents. It's scarcely worth mentioning, or it's as well to do as other people do. Oh, I must apologize, thank you. Not thank at you all, I'm sure. <laughs> Shortly after the war, there was a film that was more than a success. It became a legend. The Red Shoes was the product of another great filmmaking team. Director Michael Powell and writer Emmerich Pressburger. Powell, now 83, returned to sea stage at Pinewood 
where he shot the red shoes 40 years ago. And I, I read it, liked it very much, and said to Emmerich, it's a very good story, but it has to be a dancer that plays the part. And then we have to create a real ballet. He said, but where will we find Michael, a ballerina who can open the mouth and speak the words? And I said, well, if we want, that's what we want, and that's what we insist on having, we'll find her. She's there somewhere. It's always so, you know, when you have something quite new like that, somebody's already thought of it. In this case, it was the father and mother of Maura Shearer. meant a lot to us because it said about art what we really felt we, we felt. You know, people have been saying for years, come and die for your country and die for this and die for that. But they hadn't been saying for about 10 years, die for your art. Several of Powell and Pressburger's films were on the subject of war. And some of them were controversial with accusations of pro-German bias. Aye. is certain. All of Powell and Pressburger's films were very individualistic. Don't we know that they're counting on us to keep to the rules? Stop that it! That they boast about it? That they last... Stop it! it! Lieutenant Watson, or whatever your name is, you are not in Hyde Park with an audience of loafers. I am Major General Wynne Candy. These other gentlemen have all seen service distinguished service with the British Army. All I can say, sir, that when Napoleon said that an army marched on its stomach... I'd better stop, sir. You're an extremely impudent young officer. But let me tell you that in 40 years' time, you'll be an old gentleman too. And if your belly keeps pace with your head, you'll have a bigger one than any of us. Maybe I shall in 40 years, but I doubt it. And I doubt if I'll have time to grow a moustache like yours, sir. But in 1983, at least I shall be able to say that 40 years ago, I was a fellow of Enterprise. I'll punch your head for that young fellow. The young puppy, put him up. Take that. I'll teach you. Think you can say what you like to an old do you? Do you know how many wars I've been in? I was fighting for my country when your father was still in bum flippers. A fine killing ready for you. We must be ready. Captain, sir. X turret out of action, sir. Y turret jam. We're working on it. We made it because we were invited to go down to Argentina. President Peron and De Vita were throwing a party, and they invited everybody in show business. And Emmerich said to me, we don't want to go there, do we? I said, well, maybe we could go for some other reason. He said, that's an idea. Did you ever hear of the Graf Spee? While the hunters, those who tracked her down, fought her, pursued her, and drove her to a violent and tragic death, the hunters are back on their watch. And this is yours truly, Mike Fowler, signing off and saying good night to you from Montevideo. Nowadays, none of the so-called film moguls trust any of the filmmakers. And they don't like movies. The people who put the movies into, uh, money into movies don't like the movies. In those days, all the people I worked with were mad about movies. It's impossible, does it? I mean, I would have thought a million would look much more than that. I assure you it is. Yet another filmmaking team was Brian Forbes and Dickie Attenborough. 
they made the angry silence whistle down the wind and under the Allied filmmakers' Very banner, look, League because of it's Gentlemen. All there. Operation Golden Fleece. This is the battlefield on which we shall fight. And here, I promise you, we shall enjoy our finest hour. What price glory? A hundred thousand pounds each, tax free. I, I tell you the marvelous thing about Arthur Rank, Uncle Arthur. He, although he knew nothing about it, he loved movies. He financed the whole caboodle. It's an awful shame that we, it doesn't happen now. Because now, you know, you get a subject. The people who are going to finance the picture can't read it. They can't read the book. Too much trouble, or they can't read. Maybe the wife reads it. In fact, I prefer the wives, mostly. By the end of the 40s, Rank and Pinewood had expanded to a massive filmmaking industry. Films were pouring out, more than they could possibly hope to sell, and very few of them were making money abroad. The whole thing was getting out of hand, and they were running out of stars. Some, like James Mason and Stuart Granger, had gone to Hollywood, although other stars, like Dirk Bogart, had appeared to replace them. Rank needed to groom new stars for the future. That's when they set up a school for young actors. Rank started a, a school called the Charm School. I thought, I'm pretty charmless. I'd like to go to a charm school and learn charm. And when I tried to get in it, I found that you already had to have charm to go to the charm school, so I never saw much point in it. But there were people in it like Maxwell Reed, Patricia Plunkett, Susan Shaw, and uh, Diana Dawes was another one. But what the charm school did, I mean, if anyone was charming, it was Diana Dawes, but I mean, the charm school managed to sort of flatten out any charm she had for about four years. It was run by a dreadful harridan of a woman called Molly Terrain, who struck fear and terror into everybody. Her claim to fame was that she had coached Jean Simmons in the early days, and that she'd gone on to do all sorts of wonderful things, and that Jean Simmons never made a move without Molly Terrain, and because Jean Simmons was the number one sort of starlet then. We thought, well, if she likes Molly Terrain and she can't move without Molly Terrain, we must all sort of do what she says. It was called the Company of Youth, but of course, Fleet Street, ever uh, conscious of the catchphrase, started to call it the Charm School, and nobody in that uh, Company of Youth liked it being called that very much. Come in, you Stay at home of my heart and rest, home keeping hearts of happy est. And then there was uh, Joan Collins, I don't know whether she was in it, but she was definitely under contract at that time. She was the biggest star to come out of it. My ambitions at that particular time were really to have a career on the stage in the theatre. I was not interested at all in being in films. Um, I was at, uh, at RADA. I was very uh, dedicated to being a serious actress. Uh, although I admired people in the movies, I didn't really want to be in the movies. The thing that attracted me to it, I suppose, was the 100 pounds a week. I think a lot of actors and actresses had a big break, which many nowadays would give their eye teeth for. They were allowed to go on the set and see how films were made when they first came into the organization and knew very little about it. They were paid regularly, they always ate. They were made a great fuss of at premieres and dinners and functions. In fact, I remember going to the Venice Film Festival when almost the whole of the Excelsior Hotel on the Lido was taken over by the rank organization for the stars. We were surrounded by photographers in the whole time. Uh, the famous incident of um, uh, the mink bikini worn by uh, Diana Dawes was that year. But um, we, we knew nothing about that, actually, the, the mink bikini. She was filmed at five in the morning. Nobody ever actually saw it, except the pet cameraman. Of course, Diana Dawes could have been a problem, except that she was such a, a very, very ebullient, nice person. You could never really be angry with Diana, but she used to do what, in those days, again, I emphasise those days, was considered quite outrageous, like walking down Knightsbridge in the shortage of sort summer. You, know, you didn't do it in 1947 or 8 or whatever it was, you know, whenever she did it. Auntie? Hello, dear. Could you possibly help me out? I haven't got enough money to pay the taxi I run clean out. 
Well, yes, of course. Where did I put my bag? All right, Mum. I'll fix it. Well, come in, Duck. Mm, Todd. Yes, sir. Let's have your bag. Now, what's going on out here? It's Diana Jo. She's just arrived. Hello, Uncle. How's yourself? Nicely, thanks. Why, you've got to be a big girl, haven't you? Have I? Hello. Well, bigger than I expected. Perhaps you'd like a nice cup of tea after your journey. You're dead right, I would. But how's your mother, love? Terrible. She shouldn't be surprised if she pegged out. When British Rooms were doing their peak, we had a hundred people under contract. Lots of people, you know, it's it. A lot of them were youngsters trying, being, as it were, tried out, semi-groomed. Being a rank harlot, she spent an enormous amount of time in the Stills Gallery at Pinewood, usually with Cornell Lucas behind the camera. Now, Corny Lucas and I got along really well, except when I had to sit in front of his camera. In those days, it wasn't snap, 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 paparazzi style. It was the Harrell style in which they took a pose and they moved you an inch and then they set the lights and they looked at it and they moved you another inch and they put your arm up and then they looked again and you had to move down and it took forever. Good, good, good. Now stretch that neck, stretch it. Very elegant. Turn a little bit more. The flow of pictures going into editors of these, uh, of these young girls who were being photographed and being promoted all the time was enormous. I mean, we were giving possibly a thousand pictures out a week to different publications. I was once told that editors of newspapers had so many pictures of Joan in their desk drawers that if ever they were short of a picture from the newspaper, they said, just open the left-hand drawer and out came a Joan Collins picture and it was published. You had to do those stills for every event. You had to do Christmas stills, sort of dressed as Santa Claus. You had to do Easter stills with a little um, Easter bunny. You had to do, uh, well, there was a Thanksgiving still, I remember, for America. And um, I was always in there. Our job was just to keep on turning out these pictures. And they were controlled because um, th they weren't bad pictures. No bad picture could be sent out of that studio. They were carefully looked at, carefully vetted, retouched. In fact, they were dreams. In those days, the, um, the average English film actress was very much of the style of Anne Todd, Susan Shaw, Deborah Carr, very um, typically English, blonde, uh, frail, uh, well-spoken, nice. I didn't fit any of those, any of those bills. I was dark. I was uh, a bit of a rebel. I was a bit of a beatnik. Um, I looked foreign. Uh, to them, and um, they ca they called me Britain's bad girl. Now, what's it all about? I was on a date. I didn't know he'd knock the car off. Honest, I didn't. I ought to take you down to the police. Oh, no, don't do that. Don't run me in this time. So you've been in trouble before? I'm on probation. What's your name? Norma. Norma Hart. Oh, Norma, what are we going to do with you? This is a pretty serious business, you know. Oh, I knew you were decent. I'll do anything. That's very accommodating of it. But I remember thinking this was terribly funny, Britain's Bad Girl, because I was living at home with my mummy and daddy, and I was young, innocent, pure, and I was called Britain's Bad Girl. <laughs> Although Rank's contract stars and starlets got their pictures in the papers, many of them didn't get to make many films. They just didn't fit the Rank image. When I went under contract, they found that they didn't quite know what to do with me. I didn't fit 
any of the casting that they had for any types. I, first of all, I was terribly young, uh, but I had a very um, exotic sort of quality, so I didn't fit into the normal teenage sort of thing. And so I was loaned out a lot. It was not in my gift to alter scripts. The most I could do was to be a mouthpiece for people, unless they wished to be a mouthpiece for themselves, to the directors and producers and say, look, Dirk or whoever is terribly unhappy about this. He, he really feels, could, could you have a talk with him? And they would, you know. She was what I suppose you'd call our agony aunt. She was there to take the, and did, the brunt of people like Gus and John and the more evil people. And her job was basically, I think, I don't know what it really actually was, but basically was to soothe the contract artists. It was a very, very happy family. From the top down, was all the way down. Lovely, enjoying the normalcy. Not all film stars are flesh and blood, you know. One of the biggest stars that Rank ever had was made of rubber, leather, and metal. She's a very charming lady called Genevieve. Genevieve was about the London to Brighton veteran car race, and it starred, apart from the cars, Kenneth Moore, Kate Kendall, John Gregson, and Dinah Sheridan. Well, this is where it all began, right beside the Serpentine in London. This place was just chock-a-block with cars, Genevieve and all her old friends. And that's where Katie Kendall got out of a taxi, with that huge Great St. Bernard dog. Susie, come on, Susie. Come on, there. This is Susie. She can say, how do you do? Say, how do you do, Susie? Say, how do you do, Susie? Oh, she can do the cutest things when she wants to. It must be too early in the morning. She was, without any question, the, the greatest female clown we ever had after people like your, your audience won't even know Beatrice Lilly or Cicely Courtenage or whatever you like. I mean, Kay was one of those extraordinary things that England does produce occasionally, which are female clowns. When I received the script for Genevieve, I was working with Dirk Bogard on a film called Appointment in London, and he was terribly interested and terribly keen that I should do it. He'd read the script, but he didn't want to do any more comedy, so he turned it down. Well, quite frankly, I said no to him because I didn't think it was very funny. So that's how stupid you can be. <laughs> but he was frightfully keen that I should carry on with this. And eventually, when I did get the part, he gave me a lovely mohair rug. He said, you're going to be very, very cold when you start that film and right the way through. And I still, to this day, 34 years later, I still have that mohair rug in the boot of my car, just in case. You know perfectly well if you were in trouble, he'd stop and help you. Never. He would. Never. Anyhow, I'd never ask him to. Hold on, darling. We'll be all right. We just shot in any weather. If it suddenly rained, well, then it, it suddenly rained. Ambrose! Ambrose, wait a minute! Ah! God, it was cold. There's a time right at the end of the film when I have to get out of Genevieve and pick up the fender, which comes off, and I stuck to it. It was so cold, I actually stuck to it. Come on. Come on, Wendy. All right, off we go. Right. You know, when it came in, closed all the old music halls. But you know what happened? They took all those old music hall jokes and shoved them into some films and had them rolling in the aisles in this cinema many times. They were called Carry On. Look at that! You know, they made a great many Carry Ons and they were all shot at Pinewood. Recognize the orchard in the background? Don't think much of yours, Sid. Oh, I don't know. She's got lovely big blue eyes. You can have the one in the blazer. Well? Well, what? Well, are we leaving or not? Leaving? What, a lovely cheap place like this? I don't call ten quid cheap. Oh, shut up. Leaving, you must be balmy. It was deathly. I mean, look, we, we, I think we had gone into something like uh, October. And uh, the mud was 
really, really muddy and it was being sprayed green to make it look like grass. There were no leaves on the trees, but nobody seemed to notice. And we were frozen. Barbara Windsor, in a sort of gym slip, because we were supposed to be doing PT in this holiday camp, she was sinking into mud. Now, let's stride. Arms flinging from side to side. Begin. And fling and in. And fling and in. And she said to me, it's disgraceful, these conditions, you know, carry-ons. Here we are, sinking, knee-deep in mud. And what's the director? I mean, uh, look, look at him, he's all right, he's dry. Now really, let's see those chests come out. And fling and in. And fling and in. And fling <laughs> and <laughs> oh, Matron, take them away! Gerald Thomas was perfectly dry, you see, with the megaphone shouting his orders, you see. And the producer had arrived, just got out of a Rolls Royce with lovely Wellingtons on and a cashmere overcoat, saying, carry on, you lads. All right for him, it is cashmere, some carry on. And he just comes down here in between his glass of champagne. Today, carry-on producer Peter Rogers is still at Pinewood, waiting to make yet another carry-on. Well, I'm, I think I'm known as Mr. Carry-on. I rather enjoy that because although I've made, I suppose, nearly 85 films, I will only be known for carry-ons and I don't care about that. I like it, actually. They were made in six to eight weeks. We worked jolly hard, but we had an awful lot of laughs. Well, the carry-ons were all done at Pinewood, mostly. We did occasionally go to Black Park and those sort of locations, you know. But when it came to carry-on chase that camel, I thought we were going to get a, an exotic Morocco or Tunisia, you see, because I thought the desert, it was all about the Foreign Legion. We're bound to have expanse, vast expanses of sand, you see. Never find that in England. We ended up at Rye. <laughs> Is this it, Simpson? Yes, sir. City Bell Abyss. Well, get me down, Simpson. Certainly, sir. Hey, you, Arab fellow. Camel up, Bobo. <laughs> the Khyber Pass was Snowden, of course, in Wales. Here was the famous Khyber Pass, the gateway to India. This was a vital key point, guarded night and day by a detachment of the celebrated Highland Regiment, the Third Foot and Muff. Fearless fighting men, aptly referred to by the natives as the devils in skirts. They were always made on the lowest possible budget. They were never made cheaply, they were made economically and professionally, not cheaply. You always envisage beautiful costumes being made for you when you hear of what I call the superstars, you know. But I was always being bundled into a taxi to go around to Burmans to have a bit put up the back, if you'll understand what I'm trying to say, or a piece let in the back. And, you know, it, it was tat's corner, really, but the end result was, was fantastic. Joan Sims also appeared in a rival comedy series, The Doctors, which starred names like Kenneth Moore, Donald Sindon, and, of course, Dirk Bogard. Ironically, the producer of The Doctors is married to the producer of The Carry-Ons. She was once the only female producer in the world, Betty Box. I say I had an awful job to get here tonight. I had to swap my late duty with Nurse Gibson's bedpans. Oh. That was just before we had that awful case where we had to use the stomach pump. Um, would you rather have some cocoa? Mm. If it hadn't been for better, I wouldn't be in a movie star. Doctor in the house I found on Cardiff Railway Station. The book was given to me to read off the bookstall, and I read it on the way home in the train, laughed all the way, and rang the agent as soon as I got off the train and bought it the next day. I adored the films. They, 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 they weren't. They weren't high, you know, educational movies, uh, but they gave enormous pleasure. Now, you just lie still, old fellow. I've just got to discuss your case with these uh, young doctors here. Take his pyjamas off, sister. You, examine his abdomen. <coughs> ah, take that grubby fist away. The first rule of diagnosis, gentlemen, eyes first and most, hands next and least, and tongue not at all. Look! 
Have you looked? Yes, sir. See anything? No, sir. Very good. Carry on. Doctor in the House was an enormous success. In six weeks at the Leicester Square Theatre, we got back the full cost of the movie. And I might say, on the first day of shooting, I was rung by the head of production, a man called Earl St. John, a lovely American, and told that it would never make any money, no film with Doctor in the title ever did, and it was a little British picture, so would I please cut down the cost, which was £100,000. Now, you. When we've cut through the skin, what's the first substance we shall find? Uh, subcutaneous fat, sir. Quite right, and then we come across the surgeon's worst enemy, which is what? Speak up, man! Blood, you numbskull! Who cut a patient, he bleeds until the processes of nature form a clot and stop it. This interval is known scientifically as the bleeding time. You, what's the bleeding time? Uh, ten past ten, sir. Mr. Carson. Miss Manette, I'm here for a moment only because I'm not a man who takes much time over apologies. Dirk Bogard was the biggest star in the rank contract firmament for 14 years. And pray dispense with it. I would. But for one thing, I know from uh, my hazy recollection that my behaviour last night was unpardonable. Uh, that doesn't greatly concern me, it often is. But you made me a certain promise, which I recall as clearly as if I'd never taken a glass of wine. It shall be respected. Thank you. If they thought if you held hands and smelled each other, you know, it was sex. It was not. It was never enough for an audience. And when I wore um, pants in, well, for example, the Tale of Two Cities, they were far too tight. They were boiled twice in the wardrobe, much to everybody's horror. And I struggled into them, concealed, perfectly well concealed. But at least they were there, and I had fairly good legs in those days. Miss Minette, in all my drunken babbling, there was not one false word. Betty Box knew perfectly well what was happening with my tights in a tale of two cities. Uh, Rank did not and deplored it. And all the photographs were taken to my waist. Waist, is that where you're cutting me? We'll do some digging. A little at first, eh? What's your name? Nicholas. Mine's her say. Nowadays, he's better known for international films like The Servant and Death in Venice. But in the 50s, he did make, as well as the Doctor series, films like The Sea Shall Not Have Them, Ill Met by Moonlight, and The Spanish Gardener. I'd come out of a war when I was 26. I had no money. And rank were, was, my prep school, my kindergarten, my kindergarten first, my prep school, and finally my university. I couldn't remotely have done without. Another familiar face in the 50s was cuddly Norman Wisdom. Camden Town, the film premiere, and um, not, it wasn't the premiere, it was a sneak preview really, and we went to Camden Town, and I can see all the big noises coming in, you know, John Davis and Elton John and that sort of thing, and they said to me things like, um, hey, good evening, how do you do? Oh, hello, uh, Mr. Wisdom, Mr. Alfred, something like that, and they went in to see this film, obviously very frightened about the result. Now, I, I, I was too scared to look at the screen, I was watching the audience's faces, hoping that they laugh, and lucky me, they did. And after the film was finished, they were a different crowd of people coming out. The old St. John's and the John Davis and everybody, they were coming out and saying, Norman, oh, Norman. Oh. <laughs> it makes you laugh. And then, of course, then I went on. They were, I mean, the film was, well, dare I say it, I had an Academy Award. And um, you hear that? So I, I, I had this Academy Award, and then, you know, no problem with the remaining films, and we did another five on top of that. Sixteen films I did in all. Unlock it. Get it off. I um, can't. 
Why not? Because, well, you know, I haven't got the keys. You haven't got... In any case, I've got to get off here. I'm not getting off here. You'll have to. I mustn't be late at the yard. Come on. Find the doors! Funny how you meet people in the films who have later become successful and, well, for instance, in the Bulldog breed, um, I'd taken the girls some chocolates and one of the toughs who came in and knocked the chocolates all over the place was Oliver Reed, <laughs> smashing bloke, but he had to be tough within the film. But tough also within the film was the bloke who stopped him, see? Michael Caine. <laughs> yeah, Michael Caine. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, chum? He started a check. Oh. It's Graham. It was great fun working with you, Norman. I always watch out for famous people in little parts. There you had Oliver Reed and me in the early days. Anyway, we all love a Norman Wisdom film. <laughs> Keep your hand on this, please, because uh, I'm the new uh, James Bond. <laughs> well, you know, it's practically certain everybody's excited about it. It's my autograph. Yeah, well, uh, I'm excited. <laughs> be cool. The history of rank can't really be separated from the history of Pinewood. Excuse me, can, can you tell me where Mr. Broccoli's office is? Help In the early 60s, when the filmmaking well, bubble finally burst, set? Pinewood would have gone oh, under, you, but you. for James Bond. Set. People always talk about the British film industry, but I'm really, movies as far as I'm concerned, are, they're an international industry. I mean, what is a Bond film? A British film? An American film? No, it's, it's an international film. But all the Bonds, were made at Pinewood Studios. Pinewood is the home of, uh, of Bond. It has been for many years. We, we're, we're not only accustomed to it, but all of the chaps that work on our films, they know Bond, and, uh, and that's why Bond has been so successful. I suppose I was fortunate that I filmed the largest sets probably ever built anywhere in the world. Uh, there were some of them that well, they, they were all for the Bond pictures. I mean, you only lived twice, which had the that huge volcano set, which was built on the lot. And then for the Spy Who Loved Me, we actually had to build a stage, to which is the famous 007 stage now, which housed probably the biggest set ever built anywhere, which was the famous submarine set inside the tanker, which was, I mean, the size of a well, well over a football pitch, you know. I mean, it was an, just an enormous set. I've been here since 1952. I'm a real Anglophile. But at that time, you know, we could make a picture for a million dollars, million one, million two. Uh, the same kind of a picture today cost 23, 24, 25 million dollars. Okay. 742, take one. Action. <laughs> Georgi, Georgi. <laughs> Put him on the first plane to Moscow. In the diplomatic bag. In the Pinewood Gardens, used in everything from carry-on camping to chitty chitty bang bang, one man has seen it all. Cyril Howard is responsible for keeping Pinewood going. Happily, we get a Bond movie every other year, and. When a Bond movie is at Pinewood, uh, I don't know, there's a state of euphoria, if you like. People are happy. Cabby's back. Yeah, unquestionably, the, the, 
saddest day of my life was to stand outside 007 stage in uh, 27th of June 1984 and watch the famous stage uh, burnt to the ground. It was a great tragedy. I could never envisage that a, a, a stage made of steel could burn down, but it did. It housed at the time a, a forest set for a film called Legend and it was burned down in less than three quarters of an hour. Like a phoenix, the 007 stage was rebuilt in 16 weeks and Pinewood could continue its diet of Bond and other big American back movies, including, until recently, Superman. I remember Pinewood being a very uh, star-studded place because there was Peter Ustinov, Maggie Smith, David Niven, Betty Davis, Roger Moore shooting a Bond movie. We were doing Superman, Marlon Brando, Gene Hackman. Um, and it was, it was quite something to see the commissary at lunchtime. Um, at 24, my first film, really, that, that really impressed me. And I think the particular highlight for me in the lunchroom was when a, um, a message came from Betty Davis, you know, sort of brought over by a, uh, you know, a gopher or whatever, um, demanding to know why I hadn't been to pay court to her on her set. And that's where I found out from somebody that this is what you used to do in the old days in the movies, is that the star of one movie always went over and sort of paid court to the star of another movie. And I hadn't thought of myself as a star of a movie yet, and so it was really quite an honor to, uh, to be told off by Betty Davis. It's a wonderful place to make a picture. Too many bars. But then that's the English disease, isn't it, in that direction? I mean, that's, uh, I, I don't know if you know that, but you know in Hollywood, there is not a bar in any studio. We're always very confident that the studio will survive with the management, with ourselves, with other people that must be encouraged to come here because it is the place to make the films. Its turnover is 85% uh, from monies from America. In other words, we are that percentage involved and reliant upon uh, uh, American films. As long as England continues to be a place where Americans feel, can feel at home um, economically, we're, we're going to be back. Because of the technicians, Men like Andy Knapman, who makes magic out of plaster and fiberglass. These are the actual bells we made for the production Hunchback of Notre Dame. Once again, made in fiberglass. Here we have a fiberglass rock, made for the last bomb production we did here at Pinewood, and you can Bet your life that every rock face you see is either plaster or fiberglass. You know, in films, it's not just the scenery that's false. Sorry. Recognize the sound? This is the real rank gong, not that great big piece of metal you see on the screen. This is a musical instrument called the tam-tam, and the one person who knows about that is the third gong man, Ken Richmond. He hasn't hit a gong in years. Now that's the sound it really makes. Let me let you into a secret. It's made of wood and plaster. Well, the main thing was that I didn't actually strike the gong with any force because you can appreciate that if I had have done, then uh, the gang, it would have been uh, exposed that it was in fact just made of plaster. The rank gong is about as solid as the rest of the world film industry. I mean, in the 60s, really, the, the British film industry folded up and in the 70s, Rank nearly got out altogether. Rank was definitely facing a lot of tr problems in the 60s into the 70s because he tried, no, my dear, he tried to crash the American market, but the Hollywood studios were too well entrenched. They weren't going to let any upstarts, any Methodist upstarts, even though it was a Lord by then, they weren't going to allow him to get into their market. We thought, totally mistakenly, that the way to move further into the American market 
was to become mid-Atlantic, which is what we did. We sacrificed our own individuality, and not only in script terms, but in players, and we lost what we had originally. There were some successes in the 70s. They remade Hitchcock's The Lady Vanished. That's a poor woman. The eyeglasses. There's a copy of the Baroness. I will take some bitter. Bitter, 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 Schmitter. Be gesund. Bitter, Schmitter, that's German, isn't it? Oh, lady, you got the wrong number. Okay, Buster, I just let go. You just let go. Rank put money into a film starring only children, Bugsy Malone. Tell me you've lost your memory. And Joe Collins came back from Hollywood for a time. You listen to me. Yesterday, I, I was a physicist in a different 1971, working on an experiment. <laughs> I'd never written a book in my life. I wasn't married to you. I'd never even laid eyes on you. That's a different world. Mind you, Joan's last film for Rank, The Nutcracker, wasn't all it was cracked up to be. And what do you want to be when you grow up, little girl? Come in, Jules. I didn't view Nutcracker very well, I have to say. As soon as I saw the ads that Rank put out, something about she was a Nutcracker, I realized that I had made the wrong film here. <laughs> Then there was Educating Rita, with me and my friend, Julie Walters. Come in. For God's sake, come in. I'm coming in, aren't I? It's that stupid bleeding handle on the door. You want to get it fixed? Uh, yes, yes, I, I, I meant to. Well, that's no good, is it? It's always meaning to. You want to get on with it, because one of these days you'll be shouting, come in, and it'll go on forever, because the poor sod on the other side won't be able to get in, and you won't be able to get out. We made Educating Rita with independent money. I mean, we didn't have any distribution at all. And the first person I ever showed it to was Fred Turner of the Rank Film Distributors. And I must say, he was marvellous, because he wanted to buy it straight away, he said, this is a marvellous film, and we've just got to have it at the Rank organisation. This is brilliant. You have got to start writing again, Frank. It is brilliant. It's, it, it's, it's witty, it's profound, full of style. Oh, tell me again, and again. No, it is, Frank. It's not just me that thinks so. Me and Trish sat up and read them last night, and she agrees with me. Why did you stop? Why did you stop writing when you can produce work like that? Now, what did Trish say? Yes, it's more resonant than purely contemporary poetry. It has, like, it has in it a direct line through to the 19th century traditions of, um, of like, wit and classical illusion. Oh, that's uh, marvellous, Rita. I think it was Mickey Powell who once said, he said, you know, we'll never be an industry, but that won't prevent us making some of the best pictures in the world. And I think he was about right. I, I suppose it's unfair to say that Rank ever got out of the film business because even if they don't make films anymore, that gong symbol turns up everywhere. I mean, if I make another a film for another company and I may make it at Pinewood, which is their studio, it'll be lit by a Strand, which is, is, is their company. 
It's uh, processed by rank film laboratories, could be distributed by rank uh, film distribution, you know, in an Odeon like this one. When you see the adverts on the screen, you've got rank screen advertising. And then like all films, it's transferred into videos, which in comes rank video. You know, I think they're sounding that gong all the way to the bank. That's the story of Rank so far. But now they're back in the film business again. With this film, Fourth Protocol. It's a really good film. I mean, it's fantastic. I, I would say that, wouldn't I? Because I'm in this. <laughs> you want to see another clip, eh? Uncle Arthur wouldn't like that. Good night.